Chilean director Sebastian Lelio has made a significant contribution to cinema through his stories of unforgettable female characters, the sort of women who rarely find their lives reflected on the big screen, notably Gloria, Gloria Bell, Disobedience, and the Oscar-winning A Fantastic Woman. His latest work, The Wonder, introduces us to yet another formidable woman played by the wondrous Florence Pugh and frames the film by asking the viewer to consider the power of stories, those that society pushes upon us and those that we create about ourselves. The film, which is based on the powerful novel by Irish Canadian writer Emma Donoghue, whose screenplay for Room was nominated for an Oscar, Boast an exceptional script by Alice Birch, who wrote Lady Macbeth, and is deftly photographed by Airy Wagner from The Power of the Dog. Please welcome to the stage Emma Donahue, Ed Guiney, and Sebastian Lelio. Andrew Lowe. Um, and thank Andrew you so Lowe. Andrew Lowe, yes. Hello. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you, Tiff, for having us, inviting the film. It's been probably four years, if not more, of work uh, since also I read the wonderful novel by Emma Donoghue, who's here, and couldn't um, escape from it uh, and knew I had to do the film, um, which is produced by Tessa Ross, but also Ed Gaini and Andrew Lowe from uh, Element Pictures. Um, in the day when Jean-Luc Godard died, um, it's quite emotional for me to be here releasing the film. Um, he al always said that he would like to do research in the form of spectacle. And that is something that has always resonated with me. And he also said that uh, reality is uh, so complex. Um, so then stories give them form. Uh, and that's precisely probably what this film is about. The stories we tell ourselves, the stories we co-create and tell each other uh, stories that we are trapped in by default or maybe choice and um, and uh, sometimes stories that can become a vehicle towards uh, the next level or maybe more freedom you'll see uh, thank you so much again thank you thank, thank you for trusting me with this film and uh, have a nice uh, trip thank you And please join the director and the team for a Q&A after the screening. Thank you to Netflix for Thank providing the Netflix. film. Thank you, Netflix. Please help me welcome the filmmaker of The Wonder, Sebastian Lelio. <laughs> the author of The Wonder, Emma Donahue. <laughs> and producer, Ed Guiney. Thank you so much. Um, your, the book and the film is about kind of a fascinating part of history that I wasn't even aware of, the fasting girls. Um, did you, how did you go about adapting this book? Um, and how did you find out about this phenomenon? And did you do extra research when you did the adaptation? Um, well, I was very lucky to receive, if you can say that, uh, a universe that was that was complete. So Emma, she can, you can tell them, but uh, of course did a lot of research. And I think I became somehow a, an expert in the film, but not at all beyond that. You know what I mean? Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, it was a privilege to, to work from such a rich, complete uh, universe. Um, 
sounds like Marvel, sorry about that. I mean, <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean? It, it was really a full, fully created universe and that made everything um, in a certain way easier. Mm -hmm. I think for a film, it's not so much about extra research, it's more about finding the bones, finding the essentials, because the book is full of internal monologue for Lib and lots of conversations and lots of details about theology, and we didn't want the film to be weighed down with all those words. We wanted to really tell it very visually and find those, those, those key lines. So for me, it felt more like a, a stripping away and um, you know, letting the, the evocative elements like faces and landscapes speak. I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, w w w it, it's our uh, sort of well, my second collaboration with Emma and Sebastian separately. Emma and I worked on Room together a few years ago, and uh, Sebastian and I had worked on Disobedience. So uh, it was a lovely kind of uh, gathering of, of allies and friends, and yeah, it was a pleasure. This is such a wonderful cast. Um, you know, Tom Burke, Kieran Hines, Toby Jones, and Florence Pugh. It sounds redundant to say Florence Pugh is exceptional. I, I've been saying that so many times. Um, but this, they have so much chemistry together. So how did you um, figure out who you wanted in these roles, and how did that all fall into place? Well, I think we wrote the script. No, I don't think. We wrote the script without really thinking, uh, imagining any actors. And then when we got close to finishing it we had to start thinking about that and then Florence was always around as an idea and um, it was quite a quick process she received the script and very quickly in a few days she was in um, which is great because as you say I agree that Florence Pugh is almost a synonym of I don't know, what did you say? Exceptional. Exceptional, I was going to say magnificent. <laughs> uh, so when we knew that she was going to be channeling Lib Wright, I knew we had a film, or, or, or a great part of a film, because we, we, we still needed to find Anna, the girl. And uh, th that relationship, those, those two women are really, that's the heart of the film. And uh, yeah, so I mean, um, once we found them, we we started to build around them. Uh, but um, I always had the feeling that Florence and Anna and Kila, sorry, Kila Lord Cassidy playing Anna, were going to have um, great chemistry. And because I also think that Anna is, uh, is it's exceptional, they were going to, we were going to be witnessing a sort of actoral duel on screen, which is always such a, I think, a pleasure to see that, no? Yeah. Um, questions from the audience. Yes, in the center. So what was your thinking around breaking the fourth wall in the beginning and the ending of the film? Well, it's just a little frame. Um, a reminder that the film is happening today. It's not really 1862. And uh, it is a film about today. And it's also, I really wanted for the viewer to sort of like to establish a fair play in the sense that we know we are telling a story. We are telling a story about characters that deeply believe in their stories with complete devotion, as the voice says at the opening. And the film in, was inviting you to, to believe in its story too. Um, maybe with the same sort of devotion, maybe with the same, me same mechanisms in which fully believing works, which is, I think, the mechanisms that is triggered when a viewer is believing in a film. It's the same thing. It's, it's, it's not, not too different from that. So I thought it was important for the film itself to become part of the problem and for, for you believing in it, also part of the situation, um, because yeah, I mean, you know, the way Lib finds to rescue Anna is through storytelling. She descends towards the depths of the story she believes in and makes her resurrect from there. Um, so yeah, I thought it wasn't a bad idea to create that resonance somehow between what the characters are believing and what you are 
you know, the way in which you are believing in the film, if you did believe in it. I think what Sebastian spotted the first time he read the book was that the story is very meta anyway. It's yeah. a story about fictions, about, you know, beliefs taking on this quality of, you know, narratives that rule lives. And it's full of lies and fictions already as a story. So mm. you were finding cinematic equivalents of that. Well, and how framings of the same situation changes now, a similar condition would be viewed through a scientific lens and kind of a pathological lens, right? Um, yes. I mean, if you believe in that, <laughs> welcome. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, you could read almost anything in any way if you frame it, frame the words in such way that your position makes sense. That's also what the film is about, somehow. Um, I don't think it's a British savior story. Um, she doesn't no. save her very rationally, does she? It's not a sensible plan. Um, it's not a reasoned argument. Um, she becomes abject. Mm. You know, she's 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 a mess. She has to resort to ritual mm. um, to make any of this happen. So I think she she sheds that whole sensible British, you know pragmatist self in order mm. to make a new life. So um, yeah, we were very aware of, 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 of the oppositions set up at the beginning, and I think I think they all get confounded. I think it's been saying she goes native, I think is what she said. <laughs> it's also like, it, it is a story about belief systems colliding, right? Uh, science uh, against faith or rationality against magical thinking, if you want to call it like that. Um, and uh, more than that, I would say it's about this nurse that thinks reason is the thing that will make her uncover the hoax and solve the mystery. But then when she finds the m mechanics of how she's being fed, she also learns the why she's doing it. And the reasons are so devastating. I think that's when she crashes against the girl's pain, which is probably the only thing that's real among all these stories that are told around her. And, uh, and after that, in order to save the girl and to save herself, not necessarily the empire, you know, herself, uh, is um, she has to transcend reason. She has to somehow disarm her own belief system and act beyond reason, irrationally, you might say, guided by maybe love. Um, yeah, I don't know if that somehow helps to answer the question. Uh, yes, right there in the back. Yeah. So the music and the acting uh, and the um, lighting were characters in this film. Can you elaborate on uh, the sound and the lighting? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we were very lucky to count with great co-creators as uh, Ari Wegner, in the cinematographer, she's, she's fantastic, and, um, and Her Matthew Herbert, in the composer. Um, it was a long process of, yeah, trying to find the right tone, this sort of like dreamlike fable that at times the film becomes. And uh, yeah, I feel super, really, really blessed to have had them um, in the nu nuclear provisional temporary rock band that we created in order to, yeah, to, 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 to make this film. It is, it is audio visual, but it's also like, I'm, I'm, I'm just so, I mean, Godard died today, and he was always saying, film is also, is also a, a way of exploring ideas. You know, it, it can also be 
It can be entertainment and philosophy at the same time, and there's nothing wrong with that. And in order to achieve that, you need you need um, you need the aesthetical dimension to be to be strong, you know, to be to to, to disarm you. I think so you can hopefully experience the film directly. Yes. What an incredible performance and to hold the screen with Florence. How did you find her? What was that process like? Old school. I mean, yeah. you know, very, I mean, it, it's actually, it's a weird one. I was thinking about it also in the context of Room, actually. And there were I'm sorry, I keep doing this. Each time I think I've written a project with an impossible child that it will never it find the kid. <laughs> But but it's a, it's a, when you're casting a child at that age, it's it's you, you can't really start to look for them until you know you're making the film, because they change so quickly at that age. And you, you know she's a very particular age, and that's very important to the story. And actually, to be honest, you know we had casting directors in Ireland, and and Nina Gold, uh, who's a very well known casting director in the UK, kind of uh, leading the charge. And it was in a way kind of also similar with finding Jake for a room, actually there was only one at the end. And we found that one quite late in the day. And for quite a long time, we were scared, you know, because we, we knew we were making the film and we didn't have this essential ingredient. And then Keela just sort of, yeah, kind of, I mean, she's also the daughter of Elaine Cassidy who plays her mum. Oh, yeah. Nice yeah, yeah. Yeah, and her dad's an actor as well. So she comes from she comes from from you know theater and film acting people. But uh, but we were just so lucky, and uh, God knows, I mean that was a conversation we never had to have. But you know, it's one that you're very scared of having. I thought that was great. You cast like the daughter and mother look so much alike. So yeah. Well, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Um, Sebastian, this film like feels like such of a piece with the rest of your work, with these uh, formidable, incredibly strong women. What keeps you drawing, uh, coming back to these stories? Um, it's really hard for me to answer that because it's it's unavoidable in a certain way for re reasons that I can't understand. It's not programmatic. If you know what I mean, it's not. It's not. It's just uh, the stories I'm drawn to, and um, yeah, I wouldn't further develop. I would just like to thank Ed for um, making this match. He knew both of us, and you know, it it didn't seem obvious, but he had a feeling that we would work well together, and um, I think it showed huge insight. I was just blabbing at dinner, actually. So. <laughs> Yes. I mean, believe me, with all the regulations and child hours and the things you have to respect when you're filming with a child, um, that dimension, it's not really um, an important part of the equation. Especially in this case where we had the great luck to count with her, with her mother you know, on stage and her father too. So it was a really protected environment. Um, but yeah, it is a it is a, it is a tough story, and what the girl, the, the fictional girl, goes through, it is um, yeah, it is intense and it's serious and it's sad and it's devastating and we had to find ways to to um, to work with that, you know, with respect, but also to to also honor the story we were telling because, okay, they are fictional characters, 
but what they represent is not. And to maybe answer again why the framing and the, this is not really happening in 1862 is, it has always been happening. The film happens always. That's the space time where the film occurs to me. So yeah, it's worth it, I think. We have time for one last question. Um, yes, right there. Yes. Why is Lib portrayed as a drug user? I think that was your idea. Go for it. <laughs> It's hard to remember at this point where the ideas came from. I won't give autobiographical answers. Um, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> because she is one. Yeah. And then she is not. Yeah, it's part of her characteristics. She's also a very professional nurse. I think I like the paradox. Thank you so much for sharing this extraordinary movie with us. Thank Sebastian. you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your question. Thank questions. you so much. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. I mean, you're very sweet. Thank you.